Hello, now we're at chapter 53. Um, this one is populations, population ecology. Um, your must knows for this one is um, these uh, three Ds, density, dispersion, and demographics. And that can describe a uh, population. So you should understand what information you can get um, from those um, three terms. The differences between exponential and logistic models of growth, and then we'll have some math there, some equations we use to help explain them, and how density dependent and independent factors can control population growth. First is defining a population. You should remember from regular bio that a population is a group of individuals that are all in the same place at the same time and they are all members of the same species, so they are actively interbreeding and creating offspring. So that's what defines a population. So a population of zebra in sub-Saharan Africa are going to be different than a population of zebra up um, in the northern regions somewhere. So the reason why is they um, don't interbreed. So the changes that affect one population are not going to affect the other. When we consider the word density, what we're referring to is how many individuals are in a given area. So how many zebra per square meter or per acre. Dispersion is the spacing pattern in the, of those individuals within that area. So let's look at dispersion. Um, here's dispersal. I skipped one. Population size and density is determined by a couple different ways. You could either count every single individual. Uh, that's fine if you're working with like a pride of lions or something where the organisms are large and there's not that many. But if you're out there trying to count ladybugs in a field, uh, that would be tough. So we use random sampling where you just take a certain area, count how many you find in that area, and then assume that there is the same dispersion pattern elsewhere and you just multiply by how much um, area they cover and assume about that many are in there. And then there's a little bit more exact and this is called the mark and recapture method where you're gonna um, pick one up, like grab um, a handful of ladybugs, you mark them all, like you could put uh, little dabs of colored nail polish or something on their back and then you release them back out to that area you go out and you recapture another random group and however many are already marked that you recapture, you can assume the population must be fairly small. There's actually a math equation that you can use with the mark and recapture method that will estimate how many there are based on how many um, you keep seeing over and over and over again. If every time you get a random sample, there's new individuals that you've never seen before, usually the population is pretty big. Dispersal, um, a very common form is called clumped dispersal. That's going to be really common um, around a resource. So if there's resources available in the ecosystem, there's plant matter or food in one area, all of the organisms tend to be clumped around that resource, around that food or water. Uniform um, dispersion does occur and that is whenever there's competitive interactions going on. If you look at the diagram or the picture, these penguins are all uniformly dispersed around because they are territorial. So they have a nesting site, they are protecting their egg and their nest, and so that's why uh, they tend to be evenly spaced. Random patterns are usually not that common in nature. Their resources usually drive the dispersal, uh, dispersal patterns. So a random distribution may happen when a population is new, but as soon as the resources are kind of um, delved out and they establish their niches, then you start to see it's more uniform or clumped. Again, it's not very common in nature unless it's a new population, like the random scattering of seeds. Um, if you look at these wildflowers in the picture, uh, they may look like this for one season or so, but eventually they will start to um, take over the area and then be more um, uniformly dispersed. Demography is the study of statistics when it comes to population size, studying demographics. Um, this um, takes into account how many are born, so birth rate and death rate, 
Uh, you can summarize this data in something called a life table, and that is how um, ecologists and demographers study populations. They look at how many at each um, age group that there are alive, how many are of reproductive age, how many babies are they having, how many are lost, and they can figure out life expectancy, and they can also figure out if the population is increasing or decreasing. Survivorship curves, this is uh, a way to look at a, a demographics on a, on a graph. They represent the number of individuals that are alive during each age uh, of that, that organism's life. So a type one survivorship curve is what we as humans ex, um, experience. We have very high paternal care in our young ages, which means that there is a um, large number of survivals at young ages. So a lot of our kids live to reproductive age because we care for them and make sure that they get there. And then as we age, then our survivorship levels off and then eventually um, goes down as we reach our max lifespan. A type two survivorship curve is um, typical for prey animals. Any animal that is preyed upon as babies and as adults is going to experience um, a constant death rate. So as soon as they are born, there is a lot of them. They reproduce a lot of babies. And then every single year that they're alive, their chances of getting eaten go up. And so there's very few that ever make it um, to old age because by then they've gotten eaten by a predator. Type three is uh, usually organisms that live a really, really, really long life, but their chances of even making it um, to reproductive age or surviving the early stages is very, very slim. Um, oysters are a good example of this because they release a ton of um, spores and babies. So when they have a fertilization event, they release all the eggs, all the sperm, all at once. A lot of them get fertilized, but a lot of them get eaten right away. All these fish in the ocean know when these fertilization events take place. They eat them all up. Very few actually survive by making their way down into the sand and into the dirt, and then they have to grow a shell. Until their shell hardens, they are very vulnerable. So it takes a few days for the first part of their shell to start um, forming, but by then, once they get their shell, then they're pretty well protected all the way through. So their survivorship curve is like really high right at the beginning, sharp decline, because a lot of them die when they're babies. And of the few that survive, then they um, stay uh, alive for a very long time. But there's very few of them at that point. Changes in population size, here's where we get into our math. Um, during a time interval, DNDT, that is, um, it's logarithms. Uh, DNDT is not, it's a rate. It is the change over a certain amount of time. It is not a variable. You're never going to have to solve for the N or the T. Um, this is just an integral. Um, if you are in calculus, then you'll recognize those. Uh, birth during this time interval um, is represented by the letter B, and then deaths during that time. Usually a full year is, is our time interval, uh, and that's gonna be um, births minus deaths. Population size over time, again, those aren't gonna change when you're studying a population. You're just looking at birth rate and death rate. Um, these are our age structure diagrams. Zero population growth means that the births equal deaths. Um, this graphic, um, the age structure diagram shows Italy. They have high survivorship, um, but it seems to be that the young people are doing really well, the reproductive age is doing really well, and then as you age, you die, but it seems to be equal. They are having just as many babies born as they are having um, old people die. The zero population growth, this, this graphic, it's just kind of morbid. It's like, um, without reading it, it's very confusing as to what it's trying to tell me. It just looks like dead babies when I look at it. Um, baby equals death. But what that means is births equals deaths. So that way the population number stays the same. Um, two models you can look at. Exponential growth is very typical of a new population in a new area with unlimited resources. Logistic growth is realistic. Logistic growth is over time, limiting factors will take over and they will put limits. 
on how uh, much the population can grow. Usually limits include things like resources, water and food um, and space and reproductive rates. That's gonna cause the line to level off and that's called the logistic growth graph. Um, it is an actual model of populations uh, whereas exponential growth is like an ideal situation until those limiting factors take over. Um, that's what I just said right there. Uh, the reason why these elephants are shown is they went through a period of protection um, with conservation efforts where their numbers were really, really low in the early 1900s. And then we protected their lands and kept them from poachers and hunters and allowed them to repopulate. And then by the 1960s, those efforts really started to pay off and their population shot up, which is great. Um, but it's not going to last that way for long. Uh, there will be a leveling off period once those limiting factors take over. Exponential growth equation is represented here. So it's DNDT. Remember that is just um, the change in the population over a given time interval. You get R representing the growth rate of the population. R max is basically births and deaths. You take those rates into account. If the birth rate is higher than the death rate, then that will cause the population to be increasing. And if you just assume uh, that all the recesses, resources are available, then you can use it um, R max, which just means the maximum amount of growth that that population can experience based on birth rate um, and death rate. And then you multiply that by how many individuals there are. Um, here is a sample problem for you to try. It just gives you a population of mice, which are known to um, breed exponentially. They breed rapidly. Growth rate is 1.3. Uh, current population size is 2,500. You should be able to multiply 1.3 times 2,500 and get um, 3,250. So over the course of one year, that's how many mice are added to that population. So imagine just a few years how quickly um, that population will grow. Um, again, that is very a rare situation where resources are unlimited. Logistic models incorporate carrying capacity, the maximum amount of individuals that an ecosystem or environment can sustain. That is represented on the graph by the letter K and it will be represented in our equations by the letter K. Notice in this seriodaphnia graph, by the way, um, as these guys go way above carrying capacity and their numbers go above 180 daphnia and 50 mils, it comes crashing back down below that line. So that's how we establish carrying capacity is we look to see where um, the population tends to even out. Here's the graph or and equation used to make that graph. So our rate or change in population um, is a function of the growth rate, or R, multiplied by the population size. So it's just like exponential, but now we have to take into account carrying capacity. So it's K minus N, so the number that that population can support minus the number of individuals there, divided by that carrying capacity. And that should be able to get you a more accurate picture of how the population can grow, taking into account limits. Here is a sample problem for you to try. If a population has a carrying capacity of 900, growth rate is 1.1. What is the population growth when the population has um, 425 individuals? You should be able to plug those numbers into that equation and get 248. Just double check that you can do that so you know you're getting the math right. Okay, um, life history. Life history are traits that affect an organism's schedule of reproduction and survival. Um, there's a couple of things that have to be taken into account when you uh, figure out what an organism's life history looks like. Um, at what age are they able to mate and reproduce and make more? How often that organism reproduces? Is it just once in their life and then they die? Or do they have multiple seasons where they can make offspring? And how many offspring do they have during each reproductive event? 
And it's worth noting here uh, the role of evolution. So this is always going to come back. Big idea number one, evolution drives the unity and diversity of life. These life histories are not by chance. It is not like an organism decides that this is what's best for it or for survival. These are shaped by evolution. The reason why they act this way or do this um, strategy is because it worked and it helped them survive. And so that's why they all do it. It's not um, a conscious decision or choice. Um, here they are. Here's a couple different types of life history. Semel parity. Semel parity is also known as Big Bang reproduction, which hopefully gives you an image of like a giant explosion of, um, you know, stars, right? The, the creation of the universe. This is lots and lots of offspring all at the same time. So we are going to release all the eggs, release all the sperm. We're going to put all the energy into the reproductive event. And usually nothing is left for the parents. They usually die uh, right after this reproductive event. And the offspring are left to care for themselves or they're on their own. This happens often in environments where um, it is not stable, where there may only be one good time of year for reproduction and the rest of the time of the year is too difficult to have babies survive. So they have all the babies all at once and then um, nothing after that. So the picture here is an, an agave plant and they grow most often in the desert, which would be considered um, a, not a stable environment. Water is not um, assured. So uh, it blooms once a year, releases all the, the pollen and all the seeds all at once and just hopes for the best. And um, then the rest of the year goes dormant. Iteroparity is a repeated reproduction. So this is kind of like what uh, humans do. We have a much more stable environment. Um, so we have many reproductive events within our reproductive um, ages. We have very few offspring, but they are born um, large. They are born um, ready to take care of um, or ready to survive life. Uh, and because the environment is stable enough to allow them to be vulnerable um, in their first early ages and they still survive uh, to adulthood. So this is where we get the idea of R selection and K selection. K selection, um, whenever a population is at its limits, um, this is a population in K, under K selection. So this is when um, the parents are sticking around to care for their offspring, making sure all their needs are met, the birth numbers are low. This is iter iteroparity. Um, all the organisms that have that life structure are usually under K selected population growth. R selection is all about growth rate. It's all about really, really fast, maximize reproductive success. You have to reproduce a lot and quickly because um, the situation and the environment is not conducive to survival. So this is more like um, semel parity or big bang reproduction. The factors that limit population growth, density dependent, uh, de means that it depends on how many organisms are actually there. So population matters. Uh, this is going to be diseases and competition for resources, territory, access to mates, um, waste accumulation, and then subsequent disease, um, predation. Whenever one population is high, if the prey is high, then the predator is getting a lot of food. That's all density dependent. Whereas density independent factors are things that put populations under control and um, impose limits that have nothing to do with how many organisms are there. So a natural disaster doesn't just happen whenever there's a lot of people, it happens when there's very few people as well, um, but they keep population numbers in check. Um, here is just a graph of predator prey populations and how they affect each other. This is a very interesting case that if you had me for biology, we went through um, in great detail. These are the wolves and moose of Isle Royal, um, the island in the middle of Lake Michigan. And you could watch to see how the population of wolves experience a, a spike there at the beginning. And because all the wolves are dying off, 
it allows the moose to reproduce rapidly. And then um, the moose suffer actually um, a few harsh winters um, and climate, and uh, then that kills them off. Lynx and hare, they're predator and prey. They tend to follow each other perfectly um, seasonally, and hopefully that's what you notice, is that when the snowshoe hare population is high, then the lynx population reaches a peak the next year right after that. And that's what we uh, call boom and bust cycles. Really good years followed by a crash, or really good year followed by a crash, usually driven by predator-prey interaction. And then with humans, that's our last little bit, human population growth. We have, um, there's two configurations for a stable human population. One is a high birth rate, but also um, a high death rate. That's going to keep things stable. And the converse is also true, where if not a lot of babies are being born, um, not a lot of babies are dying, uh, or not a lot of adults are dying. So we're living longer. Uh, it, population growth occurs whenever those things are out of whack. If you're having high birth rate, but a low death rate, then you're going to get a population um, growing. Whenever a population is moving from zero population um, to all of a sudden growing, um, that's going to be a transition. Or just um, having high birth and high death and then transitioning from low birth, low death, those also can be considered transition years. Different looking age structure diagrams. Um, you could look at what those look like in different countries. The United States has a very slow growth. In fact, I think um, there were some numbers that came out last year that said we actually are experiencing negative growth. For the first time in a long time, more people are dying than are being born. Um, you can see Afghanistan, uh, lots and lots of young children, um, but not many uh, make it past age 50. And then the last bit on carrying capacity for our planet. Um, back in, this is the time I wrote this, it was back in 2015, I updated the world population um, and it was 7.3 billion. Uh, we are close to nine now. So um, the estimated carrying capacity for our Earth was about 9 to 10 billion. I think under current models, it's 12 billion now, um, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, there's been talk on the internet about all these fires and all this craziness going on with um, diseases um, and COVID that it's just our global carrying capacity is exerting um, its forces um, to keep our populations in check. Um, it's, it's a weird way of looking at it uh, from a human standpoint but uh, those limits do exist. There is a, a limit to how much we can use, how many resources are available, um, and we do have density dependent factors at work as well. And then just considering your ecological footprint that talks about the resources that you do use or that you need in order um, for your, um, during your life. So during a life cycle, how much stuff you use, um, whether it be space or resources. Uh, they say it's estimated 1.7 hectares a person is a sustainable life. Uh, a person in the United States typically uses 10 hectares uh, per person. So it starts to question what are limitations on our growth at that rate of um, use? What are the, the consequences? Maybe we are experiencing some of those now. Uh, and possible solutions, which is hopefully where our head um, goes after this is what can we do about it? This is just an interesting graphic um, talking about your footprint as a literal footprint, um, how much you need or use. And then this is an interesting map. Um, I, I love maps. Maps are like my thing. I, I think they're so interesting. And this one is a weird looking one. It's an ecological footprint map of different countries um, in proportion. Look how big the United States is. Um, the United States and Alaska are huge compared to Canada. Look at little old Canada squished up there. So the United States, um, America, we have to lump Alaska in there. They are one of our countries, um, is huge. That means we use and we have a big ecological footprint. It looks like it's the size of, of all of China. It's big. Um, Japan, that was usually a little island, looks really big too. Okay, so that's it on populations. 
Uh, hopefully that helps you guys. I don't know how to stop this now. Okay. <laughs>